episode of Buddy Movies, the place where buddies talk about movies. I am your host, Anthony Watkins. And I am your host, Mark Young. Last week, we had a great episode, in my in my, on, my personal opinion. We had uh, my brother, Daniel Watkins, back on the show for the first time mm-hmm. since, what was it, 2020, I think, the Thanksgiving episode. Uh, we talked about Top Gun Maverick. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I didn't realize it had been that long. Yeah. But yeah, I think yeah, about it had been it. two years. Yeah. It's almost we, a full uh, two years. Mm hmm. So it's a wow. It's a wow back. We started recording or we started releasing January of 2020. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because the- I always think of 2019 is when our start was yeah. because we started recording, right. I think, in November or October of that year. Yeah of 2019 because we were doing them ahead of time and we were trying to get like a backlog of episodes Mm because we'd get together and we'd record like two to four, right? Episodes at a time. We we, we did four a couple, several times. We would do four at a time. It it was like a big joke too, because we talked about how we covered Lord of the Rings in like 15 minutes. In 20 minutes, we covered the entire trilogy of Lord of the Rings. Now, I'm not going to say we're good, but I mean, we're pretty good. I mean, come on. Who does that? We did it. I mean, you know? Yeah, I, I think we owe Lord of the Rings a little bit more than that, though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. We should probably go back and redo those movies, each one individually. Our, uh, even our, I was looking back at our episode on It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, it was 10 minutes. A 10 minute episode. The reason yeah. that is 10 minutes, though, is because we'd never seen the movie. Like, you had seen the movie. I'd never seen the well, movie. Well, I saw the movie. Before. It was literally, you, yeah, you'd yeah, seen yeah, the movie before. So I had never seen the movie. It's and just it was me. this thing of like, right. I forget, what did we, we replaced something, though. There was something that we had that we both like oh. hated it so much. We're like, we're not talking about this movie. So we replaced it with a mad, mad, mad world. And I can't remember what we replaced. Yeah. It's probably in the original I note somewhere. Yeah. Uh, Which I don't know. Yeah, those, I, uh, I, I don't the, have my notes. I wasn't keeping them on the computer I, that time. I, I actually have, have my notes all the way back, like from the very beginning. Yep. I do indeed. If we ever make it big, I'm able to sell them. Oh yeah. <laughs> big, big, big money. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Uh, but yeah, as far as Jeez. I guess go, we want to have, I was talking with uh, Levi Palmer a little bit this week. We want to have him. He wants to be on the show here at some point. Uh, just a matter of, uh, he's going to okay. you know, decide which, which, which movie he wants to do. And he wanted to, he was like, he was wondering what our, you know, our full slate of movies is. And I'm like, I don't actually really want to give that away. So you know what? I'm going to just, you know, do you a nice favor. You can choose the movie and we'll review it. If you really can't come up with something, then we'll kind of, we'll show you a list of some of the movies that we're thinking of for the near future. But I kind of want to, you know, keep our list of yeah. surprises. It's probably more of a, if you could give them a list of what we've already done and say, hey, we've done these movies already. We're not touching these right now. Um, yeah. Because, yeah, we're not really putting out a list um, for a couple of reasons. Like one is the fact that if we want to adapt quickly and change something, right? We don't want to have been because we've had to redo that list every single season a couple yes. times because of changes in um, whatever life. Um, yeah. The, the other thing is, is we're not. We're, we're hoping to just make this a weekly show. Now we're not planning on stopping. We're not having it. This isn't the fourth season. This is this is Buddy Movies, the show. No, the podcast, yeah. you know, so we're just going to keep going. So we don't really have a list. Um, although I do leave certain clues on the Facebook page. Um, I've mm-hmm. put up some of the movie posters for some of the movies we're hoping to cover. Um, but it's not like, hey, this is coming next week. But I do have a couple of things right. up there. And I am planning on changing that quite regularly so that um like uh, Dune and um, the Batman were both part of the movie poster uh, compilation. And I'm going to change those out soon just to kind of give people a, maybe a heads up, but I'm not guaranteeing that those episodes will be on there. Right. They're not, you know, so. set in stone or anything. So no. Yeah. But yeah, so that might be a little help if Levi needs it. Yeah. But yeah, so let's get into it. Um, yeah. 
Which article do you want to do first, Scorsese or Alan um, Moore? Let's do Alan Moore because that one really, uh, man, that one really struck me. I mean, they actually, they honestly go together in some ways, which we'll get into. They but, do, yeah, actually. I, I did notice that. Yeah. I, um, okay, I, and that so wasn't with something it, I was attempting, but it just worked out that way. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Um, yeah. So, Alan Moore, um, we, I got this article from Variety, and apparently it's also, it started from a report that's longer in uh, The Guardian, which is a much longer article, which I don't want to get into, but I'll, I'm going to put the link to both of them in the description. So you'll be able to find them. Um, that's the description of the YouTube video. Um, so yeah, the title of the article is Watchmen creator Alan Moore. Adults loving superhero movies is infantile and can, and can be a precursor to fascism. Wow. Uh, which that's, in itself, uh, that title is just that's a statement there. Striking. It's like, wow. Okay. So not only are you calling superhero movies infantile, but you're also saying that it's going to make you be come fascist. Um, I'm just going to read the first couple uh, paragraphs here. Watchmen creator Alan Moore's hatred for superhero movies is well known as he once called them a blight to cinema and also to culture to a degree. But he dragged them even more during a recent interview with The Guardian. Moore described adults' continued love of superhero movies as an infantilization the act that can act as a precursor to fascism. I said around 2011 that I thought that it had serious and worrying implications for the future of millions of adults were queuing up to see Batman movies, Moore said, because that kind of infantilization, that urge towards simpler times, simpler realities, that can very often be a precursor to fascism. Um, he goes on to wow. express that, you know, he does take responsibility for some of his own actions in this because he's kind yeah. of the guy who he made did. comics for adults back in the right. 80s with Watchmen, um, with V for Vendetta. You know, he's done a lot of, he, he's, he's been a part of this, you know. But he, the thing that's confusing about it is he talks about how these characters became more grown up in the 80s, but they still were for kids. Just because they were more grown up stories doesn't mean they were suddenly for adults. And that's where I think he is uh, very much in the wrong because I think they were trying to reach a broader demographic. They ended up coming out with a rating system for comics, I think, in the 90s because of the vast difference in the content within a lot of these books. And some of the stuff, especially with Watchmen and V for Vendetta, you shouldn't be marketing that towards 12-year-old boys. Right? Some of that stuff is like, very disturbing. Yeah, yeah. Not all superhero uh, comics, and I know movies in particular. I mean, I can name off just a few movies like Logan, you know, Deadpool. Even The Dark Knight, to a large extent, is not a kids' movie uh, with some of the themes and imagery in, in the in that movie. I mean, yeah, yeah, no, superhero movies are definitely not just not they they, they should not just be for kids. I, I think I mentioned this before. You know, a good movie is one that appeals to a wide range of audiences, not just a single group of people. You know, mm -hmm. I just. Man, it's <laughs> so I mean, so the thing is, I feel like he's wrong, but he's also right in some ways, you know, because comics and superhero movies aren't for kids, they haven't been for like my whole life, you know, 40 nearly 40 years now. There have been some adult version of stuff, but I do realize that there yeah. is a degree of immaturity within geek culture, you oh, know, yeah. um, and but. The thing I'm trying to wrap my head around is how he leads to fascism. And that's probably maybe yeah. in the other article, which I haven't had time to fully read. But okay. like, I, I don't get what he's saying just, there. I'm curious. Yeah, what I, I don't. I'm, <laughs> is it yeah, because I don't know where the want a hero? Is. is it the idea that they're looking for a hero or a savior? That's what makes them um, more. Um, susceptible to fascism or is it, or is he equating like Trumpism to people who read comic books? Yeah. You know, or is it I'm a little not bit sure also, the, 
is, is he ahead. alluding to the white? Is he alluding to a lot of the white casting and a lot of early superhero movies? You know, a lot of the white, even in Marvel movies, they were everyone was white essentially up until uh, what Black Panther. Um, there weren't a whole lot of black black characters going on in the Marvel canon or really many superhero movies in general. Um, I'm not. Maybe uh, yeah, he's I mean, there was War Machine. He was black, but um, right. and Falcon was black. Um, the key thing was they were kind of cut out of the Avengers movies. Like, so mm-hmm. they had black okay. characters that they had introduced, they but then when they had the Avengers movies, the side character didn't show up in the Avengers movie. And that, yeah. that was definitely pointed out during um, Avengers two age of Ultron was the fact that, okay, so you have war machine. War machine was in age of Ultron, like towards the end, I think. Right. Was the end? I know he was at the it's party, so long, honestly. But it wasn't like he was part of the Avengers. It was like this weird. I remember it being pointed out that's like okay, so War Machine existed for the first Avengers movie, but he wasn't in it for some reason. He was definitely in the second one, but it it was it was really weird what they did with him because he was kind of like not really part of it for some reason. Like he was there, but then he wasn't. You know, um, right? Yeah. Because I remember the party scene where he and Rhodey, uh, where Rhodey and uh, Tony are trying to lift the hammer, and they have both of their um, mm-hmm. gloves on, yes. both of their um, Iron Man and right. War Machine gloves on. They're trying to use the that to lift the hammer. So I, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm gonna have to rewatch that. That one's so yeah. old. I keep hearing people saying yeah. that the movie's better than we remember it as too. Because I know it came out in a time where we were just like inundated with superhero movies, so it kind of gets glossed over. Right. Um, especially if you yeah, were following been, like, what, all 20... the TV shows. Oh, it was like 2015. Yeah. yeah. I was say, it, 2014 it, or it was in a time with all the different TV shows that were coming out that were kind of connected, but weren't connected, you know, and right. the one that was connected was supposed to be agents of shield, but they kept doing things that made it so that that wasn't connected. You know, like the movies were like, they'd have an episode where they're cleaning up after like Thor, the dark world. But then mm-hmm. Agent Smith doesn't isn't on the helicarrier to rescue them at the end of Age of Ultron, which he really should have been, mm-hmm. you know? So it was like this weird yeah. thing that they did there where it was like it's connected, but it's not. But yeah, so I, I'm not sure if the point he's trying to make about fascism actually makes sense. Um, no, I, I, I don't think it does. Because fascism to me just means... To me, it means that you're you're ruling, like you're, you're ruling through force. That's fascism. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you don't allow freedom of speech. You don't allow people to have their own opinions. And I just find it interesting because it's kind of like, and you put the state first because to me, like he's all communistic and all like wears hammer and sickle shirts and stuff like that. And <laughs> and it's like to me, like fascism kind of goes hand in hand with that whole thing, which I I know they're different. I know communism and fascism and all that is different, but I honestly don't feel like they really are as different as they want them to be, you know? Yeah. Right. So, um, I feel like you could be a communist and a fascist at the same time, just like you can be a socialist and a fascist and, and be, uh, you can't, but you can't be a freedom loving person and be fascist at the same time. Yeah. You just can't. That, yeah. I wonder those if don't he, go hand he, in hand. I wonder if he connects. Yeah. I wonder if he connects with just how popular they are and how they can, they draw out the masses, you know, to, to, to that connecting with fascism a little bit, you know, how, you know, early world war before, you know, pre-world war two, you know, the masses coming out whenever, you know, Hitler was, you know, getting his getting his ground under him so to speak Mm -hmm. uh and people were coming out in large waves of support of him i wonder if that's a maybe a connection point for him the fact that when these marvel movies come out especially ones like infinity war or endgame people are swarming movie theaters the lines are backed up outside the door of the the building uh for like half a block or you know i you know maybe that's that's part of it too he's just he thinks they're way yeah people are, are obsessed and uh yeah, that that could that could be yeah a point maybe. In there, you know. But let's go over to the but, Scorsese article because he says 
he's having a similar yeah. not not the yeah, fascism I mean, issue, but he's having an issue with what's happening in cinema right now. Right. I mean, and this is something that Scorsese famously criticized a couple of years ago. I don't know what year. It was a couple mm-hmm. of years ago where he criticized superhero movies, a few years ago, yeah. Marvel movies, uh, Marvel movies, uh, you know, and the Scorsese, you have to understand anyone who's familiar with his work. He did, you know, he's largely done these art house, independent, low budget movies that have been mostly original works. You know, he has not never been a, a, block, a blockbuster type director that has drawn out masses of people. I don't think any movie he's done has ever really come close to crossing a billion dollars. Uh, I didn't in fact check that for sure, but I, I really don't know of any movie that he's done that has even neared that mark. Um, and so with this comment, he, he's saying, oh, let me just actually go to the article and read a little bit from it. Uh, he says, cinema is, so the article is called Martin Scorsese, obsession over box office is, quote, repulsive and insulting. And it's from IndieWire.com. uh, It says, cinema is being devalued, demeaned, and belittled from all sides, according to Martin Scorsese. On the New York Film Festival stage Wednesday night, the director sounded off on the state of movie going when he introduced Personality Crisis, One Night Only, the New York Dolls documentary he directed with David David Tadishi. He said, cinema is devalued, demeaned, belittled from all sides, not, not necessarily the business side, but certainly the art. Since the 80s, there's been a focus on numbers. It's kind of repulsive. The cost of a movie is one thing. Understand that a film costs a certain amount. They expect it to at least get the money back, plus again. The emphasis is now on numbers. Cost, the opening weekend, how much it made in the USA, how much it made in England, how much it made in Asia, how much it made in the entire world, and how many viewers it got. He continued, as a filmmaker and as a person who can't imagine life without cinema, I always find it really insulting. I've always known that such considerations have no place at the New York Film Festival. And here's the key also with this. There are no awards here. You don't have to compete. You just have to love cinema here. So, uh... I'll read this little sentence here from the next paragraph. Scorsese has long been un- unapologetically vocal about his views on the depressed state of cinema, including his feelings that Marvel movies, for example, are like, quote, theme parks. Uh, so, yeah. So, he, uh, yeah, he called Marvel, that was the quote, theme parks uh, back a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, uh, and it kind of struck a nerve with some people, you know, who, you know, people especially who love Marvel movies, love superhero movies in general. That a great, you know, renowned director, one of the best directors, you know, of the seventies, eighties, nineties, you know, uh, made this made this statement. But uh, yeah, it's just, and like to a certain extent, I agree with him in the fact that it is a lot about numbers now. You know, studios they want a movie that this is something I've you know have struggled with the past several years is that Disney especially is guilty of this. They want a movie that is going to be a automatic profit for them. So they, they're either, either going to do a remake, a reboot, or a sequel, something they've already done so that they can, they guaranteed already have an audience in their pocket and they know it's going to show up to the movie. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, Disney's, Disney's the most guilty of this of any studio. And uh, so, as to a certain point, I do see his. I do see his uh, his point here. Uh, studios are not taking risks like he did you back in the day, back in, you know in the seventies or eighties. They're not taking risks. They are. They're just. They're doing it just basically just for the money a lot of times, and they're not creating a lot of original content. And that's something that I, like I said, I I have I very much lament uh, in the past number of years. Uh, that this is the direction that cinema is going. That you know, every once in a while, you see a nice original movie come along, but it's very few and far between these days. Uh, and when it does come along, it's a rarity that it actually does well uh, because people just they love they love their comic books, they love their Marvel movies, and they love movies that they have nostalgia for already. And so they're not going to go out and see something that's original, um, even if sometimes even if it does do well. Even if it does get early good critic reviews, you know, sometimes movies still bomb, even though they get, you know, great ratings. So I do with, agree with him to a certain extent here. Uh, but that is, I mean, the money side is. Yeah, is you, a, you would agree with him. I, I <laughs> right? Um, but the, the thing is, not, not really but also on the flight fit, right? Yeah. 
Uh, on the flip side, though, I will say, you know, movies, they are at the end of the day, they have to be about money to a certain extent. You because to stay in, in business, you have to have something that does make money. But uh, overall, I do agree with him that that there needs to be more more risks taken. And cinema has gone, in my opinion, a bit downhill. What are, what are your thoughts here? No, oh, I'll give you my hot take first. Um, I think he is an old, bitter man who is angry about his art form becoming pop culture again. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, not to just yeah. write him off. Not, I mean, which essentially that's what that hot day kind of does. Yes. But yes. it's also what he's doing to a whole new genre of movies that is brand new that he doesn't understand. You know I mean, like he is the older guy. You know, right. complaining about, you know, uh, that they're now in color or that movies now have sound. You know what I mean? Like, th they, we've had these advancements mm -hmm. in film all throughout film history. I mean, superhero films, the big blockbusters, it's what's happening. You know, you can't stop what's happening with cinema. Um, you yep. can embrace it or you can go the way of, you know, the, the dinosaurs. Um, mm -hmm. not that I want to lose a great filmmaker like Scorsese, but I mean, he's, he's, this is, you know, this is what's happening. And if he wants his art form to just be seen as an art form, then there are platforms for that. You know, there are, you know, um, I think one of his movies is coming out directly to Apple actually. Yes. And he's done um, he did a Netflix movie a couple years ago. I think silence. Yeah. Was the Irish man. Netflix. Yes. Oh, silence. Okay. S silence um, as well. But, uh, yeah, the Irishman, that was a straight, I think that was a straight to streaming. Uh, yeah. And it's, well. it's you no, know, so that's kind of where cinema is at, you know, it's unfortunate that you can't necessarily get it on the big screen, but there's nothing about any of his films to me that say big screen. Right. You know what I mean? No, he's, it's not like he, he's not James Cameron. He's, he's not, not you know, Spielberg, you know, he's not doing these big spectacle pieces where it needs to be seen on the big screen. He's doing these yeah. character driven stories. He does a lot of, you know, gangster stuff. He does a lot of like getting really in on a, a character and seeing them develop. But let's not pretend like he hasn't made a crap ton of money off of his movies, though. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Wolf of Wall Street made like $400 million. And then you have Shutter Island, which made. 200 and 300 million dollars I, I i got a list right here oh yeah <laughs> you yeah. know the departed made 289 you have 200 million dollars on the aviator you know it does drop off it's not like he's got nothing but these huge blockbusters you know but um he's made a decent amount of money even gangs of new york pulled in 180 hmm. i mean granted that was 2002 yeah but 180 was huge huge amount of money back then you know i yeah. mean I, I don't think people realize that yes lord of the rings made a billion dollars that year mm -hmm. um but that was like way unheard of you know <laughs> that that wasn't a normal thing um yeah and that is something i had in my notes to go back what you said a little bit that he i think there is definitely some jealousy here of the fact that he you know the movies types of movies he makes people aren't flocking to see, but the types of movies that other people make, uh, people are, you know, will go and see on the big screen, but they won't see his movies on the big screen anymore. So I, I do mean, think... The, the thing yeah. is, he still has a name. You yeah, know, he's uh, still Martin Scorsese. <laughs> people saw Wolf of Wall Street because it was Martin Scorsese. Right. People talk about The Irish Man because it was Martin Scorsese. You know, it's mm -hmm. not like we can just walk away from these films. Um, Wolf of Wall Street is not a movie that I can recommend anybody go see. That movie no. is vulgar, extremely offensive. It has way too much crap in it. But I sat down and watched a three plus hour movie because Scorsese's name was attached to it. Yeah. You know, well, that's, so it's that's this, the other thing. His a lot of his movies are three hours or just under three hours types of movies. And mm -hmm. uh, the amount of 
movies you can put on in theaters that are three hours long are not, are very very few because theaters want to see have as many show times in a day as they can and when you have a mm-hmm. three hour plus movie going you can't get that many show times in in a day so his movies you can't get that many show times or you're taking up multiple theaters right so if you're not pulling in a whole bunch of money then they're not going to give you multiple theaters for it you yeah. know, like they had no problem putting Lord of the Rings in two or three different theaters. They have no problem putting Avengers in multiple theaters because they know the people are going to come to it. Right. Um, but they can't put Hugo in multiple theaters mm-hmm. and expect it to get the same clout. They just can't. Yeah. I always forget that he's Hugo. I always think Hugo is Spielberg. No, that was that was him. That was one of those surprise. Uh, oh. Scorsese directed this. The same guy who did, uh, you know, uh, Taxi Driver and <laughs> Gains yeah. in New York and, you know, Raging Bull. Yes. Oh, yeah. Totally. I can totally see that. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. That was the first movie I actually saw in intro to film class. Fun fact. Oh, from okay. Messiah. Yeah, here we go. That was her very first one. Nice. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, yeah. yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Forrest Gump. Yeah, I don't really have much more for him. I mean, I respect everything the man has done for film. He's definitely, you know, he's definitely one of those iconic yep. people who, you know, show respect to. But yep. the reality is this is what's happening now. And yep. the industry can't sit back and be like, oh, let's go and do what we used to do because somebody feels bad about it. You know, that's not how the industry has ever worked. You know, we silent film killed the, or talkie talkies killed the silent film color, killed the black and white, you know, Mm -hmm. um, large format killed the smaller format movies. Like, I don't think people like people nowadays probably don't even know that, you know, theaters used to be smaller. Yeah. Um, the digital has taken over shooting on film. Uh, there's some yes, very huge directors, exactly. like Nolan and Tarantino, who occasionally, you know, still shoot, they you know they still shoot on film, but very, very few directors shoot on film anymore. It's mostly all digital these now. And mm-hmm. yeah, things have, and, times uh, have changed. And streaming, streaming is taking over for the, s- yeah. the films like what he does. If you want to make a sick mm-hmm. uh, comedy or a rom-com or whatnot, if you want to make a dramatic film, it's going to streaming. It's not making yeah. it into the big theaters anymore. The prices are going to go up. Theaters are going to become, and, I, and I've been saying this for years, I think theaters are going to become more of a spectacle thing. So you're going to go there and you're going to see, you know, <laughs> few. you may go fewer times in a year, but when you go there, it's going to be packed and there's going to be a lot of people yeah. there and it's going to be a big movie. So our film this week is Moneyball, which yeah. is actually a bit of a departure from what we have been doing. Cause we've been doing more of a like blockbuster, um, more recent movies, like movies have come out in the past year or so. Um, but yeah, with uh, this, it's more of a, um, it's more of a like archie film almost. I don't. I don't yeah. know exactly how to describe it. Um, yeah, I mean, very much a sports drama. Uh, not one that's going to appeal to the masses per se, you know. But uh, I mean, but at the same time, I do. One of my pros in this is I feel like it does appeal to both baseball and even non-baseball people. But we'll get into that. But um. Yeah, this movie was released mm-hmm. uh, 11 years ago, September 23, 2011, uh, written by Stephen mm-hmm. Zalon and Aaron Sorkin. And Aaron Sorkin, he's one of the best in the business. So uh, that's one of the reasons why, in my opinion, this writing is so good in this movie. Uh, and directed by Bennett Miller, who I literally never heard of until looking him up tonight. Uh, but he he's a two-time Oscar nominee, actually, for directing. He did Foxcatcher as well. So he was uh, nominated for Fox Catcher, okay. uh, as well as yeah, that's uh, a good one. Yeah, as well as Capote, I believe, in two thousand five, which I never heard of that movie. But uh, uh, Capote, yeah, Capote, yes. another Philip Seymour Hoffman movie. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and Steve Carell was in Fox Catcher, which he looks right. He looked unrecognizable. unrecognizable. Oh my gosh, yeah. it was crazy. It was really good. You haven't seen that though, you said, yeah. right? I haven't, I have not seen it. I need to at some point. I just never, 
Yeah, I yeah. never saw it. I heard it was good, though. I mean, that movie kind of did for Steve Carell what this movie does for Jonah Hill, where it kind of oh. puts him on the map for, oh, this guy can do dramatic stuff. This guy can do serious stuff. Because before yeah, that, they were both comedians. Right. That was all people knew them from. Uh, but yeah, this movie, it was nominated for six Oscars, including Best Picture. It didn't win any, but it was nominated for Best Picture, uh, two Best Best Actor nominations, or Best Performance by Actor in Leading and Supporting Roles for Brad Pitt and Jonah Hill, uh, as well as mm-hmm. Best Writing, Sound Mixing, and Editing. So this was a big, big Oscar contender back in uh, back before the, I guess it would be the 2012 Oscars. Uh, yeah, it grossed only 110, of course, 110.2 million on a 50 hmm. million dollar budget. So it really did not, uh, you know, like, barely I mean, made up its pretty standard for that kind of film, though. Yeah, I suppose. But uh, yeah, so there's there's some background info on it. I, uh, I mean, I'm a baseball, I'm a big baseball fan, as everyone who knows me knows. I'm a huge baseball fan. So in this movie. After rewatching this, I literally, I think I'm going to have to buy this movie. I liked it so much. I'm going to have to actually add it to my physical collection, which is a rarity these days. I mean, I have to, I have to really like a digital movie. collection. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I just, I, I, you know, I, unless I really, really like a movie, I don't add too much to my physical collection, my physical media anymore. But this one just have, may have to make the list because I, this, is a, this is just a straight up great movie. It's one of the best sport movies I think has maybe ever ever been made. Uh, certainly in the last decade, it's it's up there uh, as as one of the best. Mm-hmm. Um, my consensus for this movie was loaded with great performances, sharp dialogue, and a truly inspiring story that reaches beyond baseball. Money Moneyball goes down as a classic sports movie. Uh, uh, yeah. What did, what did you what did you think about this movie? As a non as yeah, someone I mean, who doesn't I'd, really I'd seen it baseball. before. Okay. Yeah, I'd seen it before. It was a, it's definitely a solid film. Um but this time it just felt terribly slow on my oh, second okay. viewing. And All right. I'd already seen it, so I did something that I've never done before. And I went up to the little corner there and I turned it to one point two five speed. Oh no. I never know you could do that. Um, that you could do it that depends on the app. Certain apps let you do that. Certain movies let okay. you do that. Um, but wow. yeah, so it, I, I noticed it was up there and I was like, okay, let's try it. Um, <laughs> dude, it was didn't this, affect the movie at all. It didn't affect like, the speech. I, don't even, I didn't even, nothing, nothing. Wow. I was like kind of shocked at that. That just shows how slow in my opinion, how slow the yeah. movie was. The fact yeah. that like, okay, so they were talking slow. They were moving slow. The only thing that I think it like really affected was when they were driving down the road, like things were just uh-huh. flying by them, you know, like right. in the scenes where like Brad Pitt's in his car. Uh, it, but other than that, the movie didn't seem too fast. Like even when the girl was singing her song, the song just seemed like it was in a normal tempo then instead of a slow tempo, like she was playing it. Um, wow. you, I was shocked at that. This movie um, fast forward. Oh, I watched man. the movie in fast forward speed. Yeah. And it didn't affect it. This movie. Um, but that's also partially like the, the art houseness of this film, you know, that, that it's more of a, um, trying to be more of a film rather than trying to be a speedy, you know, sports movie, you know, right. where they're trying to, you know, they're playing up the drama and the, the, the conflict and stuff is in the drama. It's not in the actual game, yeah. you know, right. you don't actually yes, even yeah. see that much of them playing. A lot of it's more in the character, the, the struggles the behind the of scenes. this GM. Yeah. The behind the scenes stuff. And actually what I really did like about this movie as someone who doesn't watch baseball is that I kind of got an understanding of what the different roles are. Cause you hear like about general managers, you hear about owners, you hear about the coach and I'm just, I never understood what the different positions, what they did, you know, yeah. but you really get a f- firm understanding of what each position is and, and how they affect the game and how their decisions can be undermined or overshadow other things, you know, um, 
like Phil, Philip Seymour Hoffman is the coach in this film and Brad yeah. Pitt is the general manager. So the general manager gets the players and then the coach decides how to use them. So right. one of the he conflicts can- in this movie was the fact that he kept wanting the coach to play this other guy at first base. And the coach was like, that guy's not a first baseman. I'm playing uh, Pena. So right. instead of playing Andy Dwyer, <laughs> right. he played, exactly. uh, yep. yeah, he played, um, he played who he felt, you know, and um, until he got traded and he had to you, play You him. can tell me if this, yeah, until he got traded and he had to play him. Mm-hmm. My understanding is baseball is way different than like any other sport you have. Because from my understanding is football, they have a cap. Like each team is only allowed to spend X amount of dollars. And that's what makes it like fair. Right. You know, so it's not like any team can buy whatever, but here we have huge discrepancies, it seems, because they're talking mm-hmm. about them being a $41 million team yes. going against $135 million teams. Yeah, absolutely. And so it just seems like the Yankees can buy their way to championships because they can buy all the best players up. Yeah. Whereas other smaller houses can't. So go ahead and explain that stuff to but, me and how, how that works, like the yeah. payroll and stuff. But yeah, ba- basically with, with payroll, it, essentially it's how much money you have to work with to to get talent on the field, to get players. Uh, mm-hmm. If a player, you know, if you sign a player to, you know, four or five years, t- 10, 15, dollars, 15 million a year, then that's going to take up that's good, a good, good portion of your payroll. Uh, and so you have to allocate, okay, how much am I going to, if I'm going to spend a bunch on a pitcher, I can't spend as much then on a, on a, on a field player, on a, on a first baseman or second baseman or shortstop or whatever. So mm-hmm. generally, you know, if you have obviously kind of we do simple math, if you have more money to work with, then you have more leeway to get more talent on the field and then to ergo be more successful then. And so that's why you have yeah. teams like right now, as of, you know, 2021, the Dodgers have a 265 or two, sorry, two, uh, $266 million payroll in 2021. Whereas the wow. A's, the A's, you know, who are the, you know, centerpiece of this movie, their 2021 payroll was uh, 90 million. So we're talking less than, wow. less than half. So to work with. it's a lot more than it was in the movie, but not as much more as the others. Yeah. You know I mean, cause right. the other, wow. Yeah. The top, the, the top uh, payroll teams in baseball are the Dodgers, the Mets, the, the, the New York Mets, the New York Yankees, and the Philadelphia Phillies. And then the San Diego Padres are five. So, basically, all the California teams uh, and the New York teams and then Philly. Those are your top because those those people, those teams draw the most crowds and they, just, they have the most money. The Yankees, of course, have a crap ton of championships and World Series. Uh, and so... Those teams are are your high market teams. So anytime there's a big talented player, if he wants a big a big contract, he's going likely he's going to be going to one of those teams, either the Dodgers or the Yankees. And that's why a wow. lot of, a lot of times why so why so many people hate those teams like the Yankees is because and I and I say this as someone, in case you didn't know, uh, Julie Palmer and Levi, they are huge Yankees fans. So I, I'm okay. saying this, you know. So keep that in mind here, but. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, oh God, I didn't say anything bad about the Yankees yet. Right, right. We don't want to lose our, you know, our precious few viewers we have. So you know, two of our three listeners. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, so, uh, but yeah, the, so the Yankees have they have a lot, a lot of money to work with. So they that's why the Yankees, even though they haven't actually won a World Series since t- two thousand nine, they beat the Phillies in 09 They haven't won a series, a World Series since two thousand nine. They still they're they're usually competitive every year because they. Uh, they have so much money to work with and they have so they can get all the talented players basically. Yeah. Whereas, like they were even paying for that one guy's contract. They were paying half of his contract right, just to go away like, to basically. play against them just to go away. Oh, we'll pay yeah. you three and a half million dollars to go away. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Whereas I, other I was teams, like blown away. Yeah. Whereas other teams don't, don't, don't usually have that kind of, you know, flexibility to do that. So, uh, the Cardinals, my, my team, you know, the Cardinals, they're like in the middle. They're usually like 15 or 16. So they're somewhere in the middle. But I, uh, but I remember it was, it was funny once when the Cardinals beat the Phillies in the 2011 NLDS, the Phillies mm-hmm. had like $180 million payroll and the Cardinals had just above a hundred. So it was, mm-hmm. it was funny because the Phillies were so heavily favored that year and the Cardinals beat them. And, uh, yeah. it was just like, yeah, the team with the lower payroll, just with almost half the payroll that you have just beat your team. Uh, it was just, 
So like, but yeah, so this movie it did it did change to a certain extent the way you know you uh, do analytics to va- evaluate talent because so many times people just kind of look like Brad Pitt's character, like 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 Billy Bean says, that, you know, people look at physical features. Oh, how how you know how big of a guy is this? You know how how much of a power hitter he is, and they don't look at the underneath analytics to actually determine his, his success. And so this movie definitely it definitely changed definitely changed baseball for sure. But you still, you still have those big market teams that have astronomical payrolls that still seek out, you know, large contracts to these these guys. So it's still a struggle. That's why you have, you know, the Baltimore Orioles. They're usually uh, they were a little better this year. They're they were like eighty and eighty, maybe eighty wins, eighty losses. But they're usually not very good because they have such a minuscule payroll compared to the yeah. Yankees and the Red Sox and all these other teams. You're so breaking just, up again. They don't. They basically. Oh, am I? The Comic Con oh. cast and slap them. Yeah. You're back. Okay. I didn't. Okay. But yeah, that's why you don't have, you know, the Orioles just aren't as successful. Uh, they have to have the homegrown talent, essentially. They have to bring players up in their farm system to be able to be successful. They can't just and, go out and buy yeah. players. Again, the another thing they mentioned in the movie is they, like, so they just make the good players and then they go to a right. better team. You yeah. Know? Yeah, once a player gets, gets good enough, he'll just seek out a big contract and he'll go to another team. And so it's just, just it's really, it's kind of a depressing if you think about it. It's this unending loop of, oh, we have good talent. Oh, we're just going to watch him go go now because he wants a, wants a lot of money. We can't afford to pay him. So, Jeez. so it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of sad when you think about it, but. Uh, yeah, but, it's kind of rough. But yeah. Um, yeah. So, where what's your rating for this movie? For this movie, I gave this a solid A. I give it a ninety four percent. I think it's you know I will agree to a certain extent. My one, if I had a one con about this, is that maybe it's a little lengthy. But honestly, I mm-hmm. thought this was really engaging, start to finish. I was never bored by it. But then again, I'm a huge baseball person, so that was my one, my one uh, curiosity about this. Is like, does this? I feel like this movie would appeal to more than just baseball lovers. Like I feel like it has the, you know, everyone loves a good underdog story and, you know, people that love analytics and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was great. Yeah. So I think, yeah, it goes beyond baseball. I think people, whether you like baseball or not, you're going to likely enjoy this movie. If even if you don't, you know, love baseball. I mean, I think Mm -hmm. most people can appreciate, appreciate this. Obviously, since it's based on a true story, that gives it some weight as well. And, uh, yeah, it's just, it's a love letter to the sport of baseball and the notion that, you know, money doesn't always buy a success because, you know, as much as, and I, I love that quote, you know, how can you not be romantic about baseball? I love my, my one good friend, Aaron Whitman, you know, he's a huge baseball fan, uh, you know, from the my, mm-hmm. my uh, wedding. And so that's, that's one of his quotes as well. It's like, it's just, it's just, uh, yeah, it's just a really, a really great, inspiring story. How you don't always, if you think different, think differently. That's just one of the the quotes that Billy Bean, Brad Pitt's character, you know, says. This, you know, the goal to think differently, not always go by whatever everyone, everyone else is doing. Create your own thing, and you can potentially have success. Um, but uh, yeah, I just think it's an all around. Like I said, it has great dialogue. Aaron Sorkin, you know, he co wrote the screenplay. You know, he did. Steve Jobs, The Social Network, The West Wing, mm-hmm. which has been, that series has been recommended to me many times. I've never yet watched it. Oh my gosh, it. I'm going to start watching it again soon. I, Maybe that should be our next show. Shoot. Right? <laughs> um, he created that that series. And, but, uh, yeah, and I just love how, you know, no one believes in him in this movie. You know, no one believes in Billy Bean, what he's doing. You know, people think he's going to get fired because he's destroying the team and destroying their chances at a, at a good season. He's, trading away their good players and bringing in people who they think are trash, you know, and yes, yeah, yeah. he, he has to have a, he has a large a long uphill battle in this movie. And, uh, yeah, Brad Pitt and Jonah Hill, tremendous, uh, good, a good score by also like a good soundtrack and score by Michael. Again, I never heard of this guy's name, Michael Dana. Uh, he, he did the good dinosaur, you know, that depressing Pixar movie that I really don't yes. like. Um, I, I I can't say it's the greatest film either. I don't. I, just, uh, I don't know how people get through the that. The kids chose that the other day, and I was just like, "Oh, really? Okay." I just can't stand yeah, that one. Man, it's not not my favorite. Uh, he also did uh, "Surfs <laughs> Surfs Up," which, in my opinion, I think I said this before, an underrated 
animated movie. It's shot mockumentary style. I don't think style. I've seen that one. Oh, I think you'd like it. It's mockumentary style. You know, obviously like like Office style. I yeah. think if you like, you know, like The Office, I think you'd honestly really appreciate it. Uh, it's got Shia LaBeouf, Zoe Deschanel, uh, Jeff Bridges. He's in it. You know, okay. yeah, obviously yeah. it's a voice cast, but the dude, uh, yeah. the dude, yes, it's, it's got a great cast in it. And I think it's a solid, very, very underrated uh, movie. But uh, anyway, yeah, yeah. My score for this film, I think, would um, yeah, I'd give it an A as well. Yeah, right around ninety-five. Um, yeah. Don't think it's a must see, but it's definitely um, something that we could do. Mm, I mean, it's something that I would rewatch. Yeah. Maybe not a high rewatch, but like I would watch it multiple times. Yeah, I did honestly put this into my C. I did, and I I put this as a rewatch, highly rewatchable. Just at least in my C. You're running out of my C's. I know, I know. I, I'm trying to use them sparingly here, but I just, I'm just on a high on this movie. Two I just, weeks in a row. I know. I next week probably won't be, depending on what, what we choose. But uh, yeah, I just, I think if you're a sports fan in general, even if you're maybe not even a sports fan, I think you'd likely enjoy this. But yeah, yeah, it's uh, money. Yeah, I thought I, um, the thing that actually drew me to this movie was, and this is how I'm seeing a lot of movies now is like i'll see little shorts on youtube or clips that are recommended to me yeah and that's what really brought this movie to my attention was i was constantly seeing little snippets of it just popping up mm-hmm. and and the in um so yeah so i'd watch those and be like wow that was a good one minute what what, what more does this movie have you know and yeah. um yeah no, it, was, it was a solid story yeah definitely yeah well, do we want to? That was Moneyball. That was Moneyball. Check it out. And shall we get into our final, final story for the yes. or final bit for the day? Yeah. Um, that will be Rings of Power, and we're actually going to finish this right. Uh, do episode oh, no. seven and eight. Sorry. No, you didn't see. I, eight. I did not see. I'm literally oh. watching it after this recording. I did not oh, get okay. tonight. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. I, All uh, right. Well then I we are going to do it. rings of power. We are going to do episode seven and then we will do episode eight next week. Yes. And then we'll have to start on a new show. That's right. We still have to. Just yeah. Me here for a Why not? Sorry. Um, okay. So episode seven of the show is basically, um, I forget what they was called. It was called The Eye. Okay, yes, The Eye. And um, episode seven basically picks up where episode six, Undone, left off, where, you know, we just had a massive volcano explode. Mount Doom um, came crashing down. At least that's what we assume Uh it was. And um, we basically get to see... um, the repercussions of that and the people recovering from that great tragedy where they thought they had won. They thought they had come to victory against the orcs. And then suddenly last minute they pull out this surprise hit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. This episode didn't do it for me. I don't know if it's because of the nature of the, you know, the fact that they were having to recover from stuff. Yeah. Um, the stuff that was going on with Elrond and, um, Durin. oh my gosh, King Durin. Durin. Yeah. Yeah. King Durin. What was going on there just didn't seem like it mattered as much. Yeah. It seemed like they were still just rehashing stuff that was taken care of in episode five, you know, like I didn't feel like they were really advancing the story much there with that, you know, um, it seems okay. like everything that happened there could have been dealt with in episode five or even part of episode six or something. And then moved on from, you know, I just feel like they, I don't know. I, yeah. Maybe it's because all the action was in the last episode, but I just felt like there yeah. was a bit of a disappointment. And then they did certain things in this episode where, you know, like, Spoiler alert. Mm-hmm. We got the spoiler alert going on. Spoiler um, alert. Yeah. But uh, Isildur 
dies. Or is but missing. we know he, he, he can't or is die. Missing. He can't die. Yeah, that's the thing. Is like we know he can't be dead. So yeah. it's like, okay, what? Like, don't do that. <laughs> and then, and then at the very end of the episode, they go to the bottom of the mithril mine, and they show us the Belrog. Yes. yes and it's do. like, what? Where are you going with this? This makes. Yeah. I'm. Are you insane? Yeah, like, this is way too early for that. I'm a little torn because, like, I'm at one point, like, I'm very excited to see the Balrog, and it looks just, even though it's like a one second shot, it looks great. It looks amazing. <laughs> yeah, it uh, did look good. But at that same time, I was kind of with you. I'm like, okay, so where do they, where are they, where are they going to go with this right now? Because we already have so many stakes right now. We have Sauron on the rise. We have uh, those three pale looking mystery characters that set the uh, set the Harfoots uh, houses on fire. We don't know who they are. Yeah. But they're a new threat now, and we got obviously you have the stranger uh, still, you know, missing or whatever. So we have all these things happening. But on top of that, now you got a Balrog. <laughs> so I, I feel it's one of those things where like they reveal him, but they're not going to do anything with him for like who knows. I mean, obviously there's one episode left here uh, until the next season. So I'm not sure if he's going to yeah. show him the finale. But yeah, that that was an interesting choice for sure. I mean, I was excited to see the Balrog for sure. I mean. Like I said, it looks fantastic. But and then we find out uh, Queen Muriel is blind, which to me I'm kind of annoyed by because I'm like, was there anyone else that was blind by this? And also, how did she actually get? I know. Yeah, why is she? Why her? Why why not everyone else? Exactly. Why her specifically? Just because she's an important character, right? I mean, (laughs) uh, it just feels a bit like a cop out. I. Yeah, yeah, it felt like the writing here was just like lacking and like they, they didn't know how to. I don't know. I just feel like uh, I'm confused about this. So yeah. I, I just don't know what they were trying to accomplish with this episode. You know, you have a little bit of relationship building between Theo and Galadriel, but why? Yeah. You know, and then. <clears throat> You have, um, like the Numenorians being like, "Oh, we're going to come back," but acting as if they're like, he, "He's so he like, oh, his son died, so now he just completely regrets what he did and completely hates everything here." Instead of recognizing the fact that this is an even bigger threat than they realized, mm-hmm. they need even more help than they realized. You know, Elendil, uh, the yeah. So it's like, dude, like, I I don't, I just feel like the, it just felt off. Like we had been through so much with the characters and I feel like it had built up to episode six. I was so excited with episode six. Yeah. This just felt like a bit of a letdown Mm -hmm. compared to what we had just seen. Yeah. And I thought you had mentioned, uh, I'm not sure if you texted it to me or if you posted it, it it made the same mistake as, as Game of Thrones, but mistake was that was it? Was it the fact that the you know when the Night King episode happened in Game of Thrones that everything from there like that was such a high peak that everything kind of then after that was like okay now what type of thing or was it something else? Hmm, did I imagine? Did I, say that? did I imagine that? Maybe I dreamed that. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you I thought that. you. I, I could be. Well, I thought you had said something like this: "The Reigns of Power made the same mistake," or no, you know what? That may have been a. Uh, that may have been like a screen rant article. For some reason, I thought you had said it, but you you may not have. Um, mm. yeah. um, I do know they do something similar in episode eight that mm. happened in Game of Thrones or um, House of Dragons episode eight. I see. Um, but I didn't say anything about that on online. Yeah, because I I usually say that stuff for the show. Right. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you, usually I don't release my opinions on that stuff when I'm doing a show about it. Yeah. So, no, that was probably a Screen Rant article or something. Um, but, yeah, I wonder what that mistake would be in Episode 7. But, yeah, yeah I just was, um, yeah, it just felt a little odd. The only, the only, there was one good scene in this, and it was, I'm debating whether it was actually good. It was because 
it was, it was a t- kind of a, it was a tension filled scene. It was with a scene where I forget if it, who, ex- who exactly it was. It was Nori, I believe. And maybe it was Nori and someone else that were hiding under a tree trunk and mm-hmm. there were orcs nearby, like above them. It was almost shot for shot, the same scene as in the fellowship of the oh, ring. That was and Galadriel and Theo. Was it Galad- oh, Galadriel and Theo? Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was almost shot for shot the same scene as in the Fellowship of the Ring when Frodo, Pippin, and Mary are hiding from the Nazgul, and it stops. Mm-hmm. And like I was just like, man, yeah, like, I see what you're doing like there. The, like he's pulling out the sword. Yeah, she's like puts her hand on him to stop right. him from the sword. It's like the exact Versus same like thing. Frodo pulling out the ring, but Sam right. putting his hand on him, being like, "Don't do it." Exactly. No, yeah. So it it is doing. I mean, they are trying to do certain nods to the material, but sometimes I feel like the dialogue is trying too hard to come up with Tolkien sounding language. Hmm. Um, like just certain things that they say where it's like, dude, I know what you're trying to do. Like at the end of this episode, when um, the queen is talking and saying stuff about how, yeah, we're going to go and we're going to bring back more people and, you know, and, and we're going to, we're going to do this, you know, we're going to, forge the whatever of men and elves and da 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 you know and they're right. trying to make it sound all epic and everything and it's like yeah but i mean like you're writing this and coming up with it on your own because you don't have the rights to tolkien stuff about this so i don't know they're just trying too hard on some mm-hmm. of the dialogue i think whereas i feel like if they would just relax and try and let the show just be its own thing yeah 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 it's yeah it's tolkien but it's it's still the fact that it's not really it's not lord of the rings you know it, it's 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 supposed to be its own show it's supposed to be original in a way and i just feel like they need to decide if they're going to embrace that or if they're gonna keep trying to live up to the other namesake right yeah and yeah, one of the pros I actually did have with this episode was the conversation, was the drama between Durin and his father, King Durin. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, that, that scene with him ripping off his, you know, whatever it was around his Chest neck. Plate, like, yeah. Yeah. Like that was a that was a that was a great scene, I thought. Like his relationship with him and his father now being strained, obviously. And mm-hmm. uh yeah, I I did like that 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 plot element for it, but I will agree with you that they seem to have been dragging out this whole Elrond, will they or won't they give them the mythreal theme for like three or four episodes? And it's just, as it's felt like it's just, it, it's felt like it's been it's been dragged out a lot. Yeah, and, yeah, and they spent like half this episode alone doing that again. But um, what else did I have here? Da, da, da. Yeah, then there's yeah, like I said, these these strangers. I still don't know who they are. These, these these wizards that you know can apparently we we see what some of the damage they can do. They set they set the uh, some of the Harfoots' houses straight up on fire, and and it's the flash an instant. So we still don't know who yeah. they are. But now that we know what they're after the stranger for reasons reasons. I, I wish they would have let us know if any Harfoots got killed there. Because right. they didn't let us know any of that. They was like, wait, so did the people die or is it just like their stuff destroyed? Like yeah. what kind of destruction happened here? Like, are these people actually being like, are they villainous or are they trying to set something right? You yeah, know well, what I mean? Cause a well, lot of, I thought we heard screaming like in the background. I could be wrong, but I thought okay. we heard screaming at least. So I, yeah, I, was I mean, they're they're obviously like, like, yeah, to me, they're obviously bad guys, you know what I mean? But yeah. I'm just like, but if that's supposed to be Sauron, then it's like a really poor, like, I don't know how that works. Yeah, You know, like that doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, but we'll, we'll see. Yeah. The other thing is, it's obviously female this time too. Yes. You know, so it wasn't like this amorphous, you don't know if it, what it is, who it is. It was like, oh, okay, that's, that's a girl. Mm-hmm. Okay, they're all girls, all three girls. So, what do what are they? Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I like I said, I'm I'm gonna watch the finale right after this recording. I'm excited for it. I hope it's a good episode. Uh, I know you're kind of. I think I see you holding back. You know, thoughts. Yeah, well, I'm definitely holding back thoughts. But um, I am pumped. I'm excited. I hope it. I'm not. I think you'll definitely enjoy it. Feel okay. free to text me. Oh, I will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
that'll be uh, yeah, yeah. episode eight. Then I don't know how long are we going to have to wait for probably two years until uh, until mm-hmm. the second season. I'm guessing. And I'm not sure if they've actually released released or given a release date I, for it. But. There was a title of an article today that uh, it said, "Now that the first season of Rings of Power is done, now." Amazon will have to spend the rest of their time marketing telling us that it was good. Oh, yeah. Or something like yeah. that. And I was like, oh, so harsh. <laughs> trying to convince us that it was popular or something like that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll see. I don't know. Yep. Um, I'm liking it overall still. Yeah. So I'm still giving it a thumbs up. I still think I want to see more. Mm-hmm. Um, but we'll, we'll see what happens next week. Yeah. Definitely. All right. All right. So that is our episode for this week. Thank you very much for sticking with us through all those technical difficulties and sick voices and stuff. Um, at least my voice is a little off because I'm not feeling well right now because oh. my family's been sick all week. Yeah. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll see you guys next week. And remember to stay cool. Stay cool. Oh, yeah. You know what? Like, share, subscribe. I always forget yeah. this part. Like, oh. share, subscribe. Um, check out our website. Check out our... Um, we, our we need to work on our, that website. Our, our Facebook. Yes, we do. We still need to add stuff to it. Um, and the, the website and Patreon. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, patreon.com. We are on f- movies. What social media are we? We're Facebook and Twitter, correct? Facebook, Twitter. Yes. Yep. All right. So, yeah second outro thank you so much for being with us have a good day stay cool